And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen. sermon done before it's begun? Am I starting at the end? What does it feel like to receive the benediction before worship concludes? Startling? Worried that I'm confused? Every story needs a good ending. And Jesus and Paul are bringing their stories to a close with both scriptures that Greg just read to you. Jesus has been crucified and resurrected and in Matthew 28, this is Matthew's version of Jesus' farewell address to his 11 disciples. 11? Remember... Judas betrayed Jesus and has killed himself at this point. In 2 Corinthians, Apostle Paul is saying goodbye to his beloved Corinthian church, which he established, a church whose members have been fighting with each other over all kinds of issues. Last month was full of graduations. If you were valedictorian, what would be the most important statement that you'd want to make in your commencement speech? If it's a high school graduation, would you want to acknowledge your doubts and your fears about moving away from home and off to college? Or, if your child is graduating from kindergarten or junior high and, or going off to camp this summer, what would you want to say as parent to assure your child that he's prepared for the unknowns that lie ahead. Or, if your grandchild is graduating from college and moving to a new town for a new job, how would you encourage her that she's equipped with what she needs to launch her new life? One mother in a Wall Street Journal this week, a uh, Wall Street Journal article this week, advised her son going off to college, eat vegetables and Twitter me. <laughs> Some of you may have family reunions this summer. How do you say goodbye to each other when you can't be sure that all will be together for the next family reunion? Or, if you have only a few days to live, what's the essential things that you want to say to your loved ones and friends? Let's see how Jesus and Paul phrase their charge and their blessings to those whom they love. When Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, notice, Jesus doesn't expect us to be perfect students, perfect parents, perfect disciples as we go forth. The disciples themselves messed up fairly regularly. Remember Judas' betrayal and Peter's denials. Going forth, traveling through life is what we naturally do, whether it be to work or school or vacation or to let's help. We're always a discipling work in progress. 
Remember the story of the mustard seed? Faith the size of a mustard seed is all we need. It's enough. But some of us allow our rationalizations, I haven't learned enough, or our negative experiences, last time I tried sharing my faith was a disaster, or our doubts or our fears to keep us stuck up on that mountain instead of coming down and going forth looking for opportunities to disciple others. By disciple others, I mean share our stories of how and where we've seen God at work in our lives. Our job isn't to convert or coerce. We share our faith experiences and then let God have space to work in others' hearts. The third part of Trinity's mission statement picks up this theme. Glorify God, share Christ's love, make new disciples. That's our mission statement. Jesus knows about our doubts. Notice the disciples, even as they worship Jesus face to face, some doubted. Worship and doubt go hand in hand. Worship and uncertainty. Devotion and hesitancy. A mixture of faith and doubt together are the real ingredients of discipleship. We all have questions and doubts at different times. Preacher Fred Craddock dismisses those who say, God said it, I believe it, that's that. Craddock responds, and I quote, Whatchamacallit will freeze over before we have total faith without any questions at all. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is more practical in his parting words to the contentious Corinthian church. Paul urges them to put their lives in order, to focus on compassion as the way to live the true life of a disciple. What Paul wishes for them is that they live in community with one another without attacking each other. Paul points to the fellowship in communion with each other that's missing from their lives. Paul encourages them to acknowledge God's commitment to them to us and that they, we, are called to be God's instruments of grace, of love, and of community with each other and out into the world. Both Jesus and Paul use the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as their authority and as their credibility to commission, to send disciples forth to disciple others. Where do Jesus's and Paul's authority and credibility come from? I'll bet they wish they could say to us, as parents often do, just do what I say, stop arguing, because I said so, that's why. But Jesus reminds us, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus' authority is vested in him as part of the Trinity, an equal partner with Creator God and that pervasive power of the Holy Spirit. 
this doctrine of the Trinity, our three in one God and one in three God, developed as early church fathers pondered and lived and prayed about the meaning of these two scriptures and others. To understand the fullness of God, we have Father, Son, Holy Spirit coming to us in multifaceted ways in our lives. As we perceive the presence, the challenges, the comfort, and the assurance of the Trinity, as we live into their light, we discover the truth of their authority and their credibility. It's powerful as it becomes lived experience rather than abstract doctrine handed down from the pulpit. No one can force you to follow. Jesus beckons to you calls you by name, speaks to you from the traditions of the church, or speaks to you in ways that touch you, whether it be texting or twittering or talking to your heart. When we follow, because Jesus has followability, we develop that close personal relationship not only with Jesus but with other followers. What we call the fellowship or communion of the Holy Spirit in our benediction. As we strive to talk about the fullness of God we're compelled to talk about God in the particular time and place of our lives, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, within this particular family of faith in Topeka, Kansas, in 2011. For example, we'll baptize Emily Lee on July 10th in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We'll baptize with water and words in the presence of God and in the presence of you, the congregation, in this sanctuary. In the presence of the fullness of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I'll ask you what role you'll play as you vow to nurture Emily into the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Will you teach Emily? Will you mentor her? Will you teach her the songs of the faith? Will you encourage her? Will you send her a card on her birthday or as she goes off to camp? Will you accompany her on a mission trip? Will you seek her out for special time together? When we make these vows and commit ourselves to them, we follow even in times of doubt or despair. The last part of Paul's and Jesus' benedictions are the assurance that, I will, that Jesus will be with us forever to the end of the age. What I mean when I say be with you and abide with you now and forevermore. Just as my father and John Farrell Higgins' mother and any of your parents who've joined the communion of saints will always abide with us, so much more deeply will Jesus abide with us, remain with us, dwell with us to the end of the age.
Thanks be to God for the fullness of the Trinity and the foreverness of Christ's presence with us. Ready or not, here we go. Amen. Amen.